Well, good morning, Riverbend in the house. And good morning, Riverbend online and Riverbend on your rowing machine later. Good morning, Riverbend, however you are here. And welcome to the Riverbend Graduate School of Theology, Session 2. Dave Haney began last week by introducing us to these five solas that, that Travis mentioned. Five things that in the, in the time of the Reformation, five sets of belief that the church identified and said, these are sufficient in themselves, alone. That's what sola means. So it's grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, scripture alone, God's glory alone. And so over these five weeks, and this is week two, we're going to be geeking out on this. There's no truth to the rumor that Dave and I are twin brothers. <laughs> Even with the vesty thing going on and the glasses and all that we do, no truth to that rumor, but we do love to play. We love to, we love to get geeky together, and when life gives you geeks, you just have a geek fest, right? So welcome to Geek Fest 2, and I want to begin, since it is about uh, sort of classroomy things, and also since it's graduation weekend for a lot of people, I want to begin in a first-year college classroom. When I was a freshman at George Fox College in Newburgh, Oregon, freshmen were required to take a Bible 101 class. We were required to go through the Bible in one year's class, so from September through May, we went through the whole Bible, and our teacher was the most celebrated faculty member, even though he was the youngest, on the campus, and he was also the most difficult grader. And we had heard this reputation, so we came into the class with some trepidation, but we, we had made it through about two-thirds, maybe three-fourths of the year of very hard assignments, very, very demanding syllabus, when about four weeks before we were to close the semester, he told us what was going to be on the final exam. And we're, we're all just shouting, yes, because he was hard, he was hard, he was hard, and then it sounded like he was easy. And so 80 freshmen, 18 and 19-year-olds with pencils poised, sat and listened as he told us what was going to be in, on the exam. And, and, and we sat there, and he had three words that formed a question. He said, when we gather in four weeks for your final exam, you're going to have two hours to write a, an answer to the question, three words, what is faith? And you know, most of us were Christian folk who had given our lives to Jesus at some point in our, in our youth, and so we knew what faith was. Faith is what we'd already done. We, it, faith is believing in God through Jesus. We, we thought, this is a breeze. We've got four weeks simply to play because this is going to be easy until we sat down and actually asked the question. And it turns out that there are a lot of Bible verses that mention faith. In the New Testament alone, 393 times, we get this Greek word, pistis, or its verb, pisteo, right? Now you can say you've, you've done your Greek for the week. Pistis means here, I'll, I'll give you two definitions. Pistis means, as a first definition, something that you'll, will surprise you, I think. It means trustworthiness or faithfulness. When you and I think of faith, we think of believing in something. We think it's our job, but... But the first definition in all those big lexicons and dictionaries that Greek people have to learn from, it is trustworthiness or faithfulness. The second definition is trusting, believing, having faith. So even in the dictionary, even in the definition, you start to see something that's going to help us with our definition. You see that it is 
the faithful one, the one who is faithful and trustworthy, into whom we believe. But there were tons of other verses that our heads scrambled to. And so last fall we did a a thing on Hebrews 11 in in Riverbend, but our little minds, our little freshman minds in college were running to all those different passages on faith like Hebrews 11.1, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's a good definition. Faith is, right? So we all wrote it down in our little books. But then there was Matthew 17 where it said, if you had a faith, Jesus said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, a tiny little seed, you can say to that mountain, be thrown into the sea and it will happen. And we thought, well, faith may be being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see, but it's also got this serious power thing going on. And then we We thought about that famous verse, the central verse, and we had learned some of this kind of thing, that faith is believing. It's not just the F word, it's the B word. And so we went to John 3.16, the most famous passage in the New Testament for a lot of people, which is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So so not only is it... uh, believing that what we see is actually what we can't see is actually true and not only is it mountains going into the sea it is also how we somehow come around to getting saved salvation right and there were more verses so we scrambled and we came away realizing that our very smart professor was smart enough to give us a simple question that took us through a whole lot of complex things I'm not going to tell you the grades, but we learn stuff. We learn stuff that matters for today, and so what I want us to do as a crew today is ask, what is faith? We've done a little Greek, but let's ask, what is faith? And then let's ask, why is it a sola? Why only faith? And those two questions will occupy us, but let's pray for help so we can get them done well. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so what is faith? We've got this two-part definition of it, but I, I wonder if faith is believing or trusting or having faith in a trustworthy and faithful one, Does that give you something to go home with yet? You know a definition. You know a definition, and that's that's nice. But I like pictures. Last week we did grace. And so we did this uh, verse from Ephesians chapter 2 that hooked up grace and faith. And it is simply the, the second chapter of Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Dave spent a whole lot of time last week in Ephesians 2 in a powerful sermon, kind of moving through this. So part of this is previously at the theological school, right? Part of this is just catching us up because we're used to being bingers on TV, but when you have to wait a week, it's hard to remember what happened. But part of it is, can you put the passage back up, please? Part of it is that grace and faith get twinned here. Can you see it? For by grace you've been saved through faith. How do those things associate with one another, and what does that have to do with believing in or trusting in a trustworthy, faithful one? Well, try this on. I've been trying to get a picture for you all week as I prepared, and the one that I come to makes you probably not as excited as you might be because in this, you are a solar panel. Now, you may like solar panels, some of you have solar panels, but you may not be excited about being one. Here's the deal. The sun is God, right? The sun is God, and the beams of the sun, the rays of the sun, the way that sun reaches us is grace. That is, God the trustworthy one, God the faithful one, shines and shines on good and, good and evil alike, as, as Jesus puts it in, in, his, in his teaching. Faith 
is the receptor. Simply receives it. How good is faith without a sun, or how good is a solar panel without a sun? It's just a decoration. But what happens with it, with the sun, is these beams of light become energy, become power, and all kinds of good things go, happen, like uh, bills going down for your electricity, right? We're going to explore a little bit about how the definition of what faith is and having it be the receptor helps us to get around some of the things that have plagued and been obstacles to, to Christian understanding in the past. All right? So, think of it. Sun shining. Last week we got grace. Grace is that ever-present, ever-present kind of unmerited favor of God. God loves us no matter what. Right? And it, it can be that it hits a rock and, and doesn't go anywhere. But if faith shows up, it has a place to produce a whole new thing. Right? So think of yourself as a solar panel. And it, it, it'll all work. Um, <laughs> so if we start with what is faith, and we've got a little picture in our brain, let's move on to how it became a sola. Why was it an only? Why did the reformers, so, why were they so keen on saying it's only faith? What were the competitors? How did it end up being so important? And for that, it all started at a law school graduation. You may not know this, but the great reformer Martin Luther, who posted 95 theses on a Wittenberg door in 1517, earlier as his first career, trained to be a lawyer. His daddy wanted to be a, him to be a lawyer, so he went to the nearest place that he could go to law school in Erfurt, Germany, and he studied law from 1501 to 1505, and he graduated. Except that after a couple weeks of practice, he went home kind of to get his dad's attaboy, I think. He had been practicing his law in Erfurt for a couple weeks. He went home to get his dad's approval for having done what his dad wanted. And he had you know, dinner with the family, probably washed his clothes like students do, and came back. And on the road back from his hometown to Erfurt, he was laid low by this amazing terrifying thunderstorm. Now, in medieval ages, they didn't know quite where thunderstorms came from. So they took them to be either judgment or a, a terrible curse or something that was visiting them, and he was caught and he feared for his life in this thunderstorm. So you've got Martin Luther cowering just worried about his life, worried not that he won't last out the storm so to speak, and he prays to God, if you rescue me, if you save me, I'll become a monk. And lo and behold, no fatalities. And he makes it home to, or to Erfurt to go start practicing law, and he, he tells his, his law practice, I'm not doing this, and enrolls in the monastery instead. All of the rest of the things we know about Luther never would have happened if not for that thunderstorm we imagine. So thank God for the thunderstorm in a way. But when he then entered the monastery, you can guess what his primary concern was. I just about died and I wasn't ready. I just about died and I didn't exactly know how I was going to face things. I got to figure out what saves a person. And so he started to dig in and he read scripture and he, and he asked a whole lot of questions about it. And then in 1515, he became a professor at Wittenberg, where he ultimately got famous. But he became a professor, and he taught the letter to the Romans for a year and the letter to the Galatians for a year. Now, you know those 393 occurrences of faith language in the New Testament that I mentioned before? A lot of those happen in Paul's letter to the Romans and Paul's letter to the Galatians. And so let's look for deepening our, our understanding of what faith is along with solar receptor. Uh, let's, let's look at those passages. The first one is from Romans chapter 3. Now Paul had this task of writing to a church he had never met before. 
He knew some people who were, lived in Rome and went to this church, but he had never been there. It was his habit only to write to churches where he had been the founding pastor, right? where he had been the plant pastor. But he, that's not so with Romans. He was writing to an unknown church, but he very much wanted their help because he, he wanted them to think well of him, but they all, he also maybe wanted to have them help him as he continued his mission. There was a lot at stake, so he wrote Romans. But the problem in Rome came out in, in chapter 3. Can we get the uh, 321? But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him apart from the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for anyone who believes, no matter who we are. We are made right by placing our faith, by believing, trusting in Jesus Christ, the trustworthy one. Do you see how our one-two comes back? But let me set it in Rome so, so we understand what the, what the reason the sola was for Paul. In Rome, there were two types of Christians, and Paul knew this because the grapevine got around in early Christianity. Two types of Christians. One were Jewish Christians. That was the main people. This, by the way, along with being Memorial Day weekend, this is also Pentecost weekend, so a lot of churches around the world are celebrating the birthday of the church. And, and so the first people who became Christians were Jews who followed Jesus and became Christian, right? In Rome, there was a pretty heavy lot of Jewish Christians in, this church, in these churches to which Paul wrote. On the other hand, there were Gentile Christians, Christians who had, were not from the Jewish people, had never heard of Moses or Abraham or any of those things. And how do you think the dynamic might have gone in that little church? Well, it turned out that the Jewish Christians started to say, huh, we were here first, right? We got Moses. We got Abraham. We're the real deal Christians. You're Johnny come lately, Janie come lately, so let's just get this straight. We're the ones God likes more. Now, they didn't put it as crassly as that, right? Mama likes me best. They didn't put it as crassly as that, but the dynamic started to happen that there was a superiority-inferiority thing going here, and Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. He was mainly concerned about sharing the good news that God was for everybody, that God loved everybody the same, that Gentiles had a way in to the blessings that used to be just the chosen people. So he writes to them, and he says, Now, apart from the law, you get saved simply by believing in, trusting in, having faith in Jesus Christ. What, would, what does that do to law? What does it do to the advantages of the Roman church, of the Jewish Christians in the Roman church? It kind of undermines them, right? Suddenly there's a level playing field for everyone who's coming to church, and suddenly the Gentiles have an advocate, and everybody starts to sneak their head around. Maybe God does like everybody just as much. So part of Paul's sola has to do with the fact that if there is an advantage for Jewish Christians because they know and keep law, this just doesn't work. The truth that God loves everybody the same won't get out if that's the case. That's why God used grace. That's why God made the only way in faith, sola receptor. You with me so far? So that's one of the problems that Paul was dealing with. The other was in Galatia. Galatians was a church that Paul founded. And Paul founded it and started it, and they went nuts about the gospel. They had the spirit break out among them. The letter is full of indications that they had a great beginning. But after Paul left, because Paul did kind of churches everywhere... Paul started the church in Galatia, got leaders in place, and then went on to cold call another city. And there they were, happy to have seen him. But what happens when other teachers come to town? Well, Christian teachers from Jerusalem come to town in Galatia and say, you know what, that Paul, he's a great guy. We really like him. Don't get us wrong. But he left out some kind of crucial things. You have to keep the whole law of Moses and every male in your household gets to, has to get circumcised. Any questions? 
Do you feel the weight of that? Do you feel the weight of Gentiles who never were under the law with Moses and never were sort of burdened by all of that, suddenly having to carry it around? But these guys sound compelling, so they've started to leave. And Paul's letter begins with the words, I am astonished, you foolish Galatians, how quickly you have left the grace that was offered to you. So on the one hand, we've got the attempt to make level ground. On the other hand, we've got Galatians who are being loaded on with burdens that the Jews haven't been able to keep through all the years. And Paul has to get back and say, it's only faith. It's only faith. Do you see that? Now back to Luther's time. In Luther's time, there were these things that had developed over the last pretty much 500 years, but we'll go 400. Anybody know the word indulgence? Indulgences were ways that you could get. Now, you know the word purgatory? Yeah, so, so Jesus didn't talk about purgatory. Paul didn't talk about tur- purgatory. We only heard about it from the medieval uh, Roman Catholic Church, and it became a sort of way station where people worked off the things they had done wrong in the world, right? And so purgatory was where you did the labor that made up for your sins, in a way. Indulgences were a way to get free, kind of a get-out-of-purgatory-free card. And the Pope used them, popes across the years, used them to incentivize doing things he wanted people to do. So, for instance, they couldn't get people to go off and fight in the crusades that they were launching in Jerusalem, in, in other parts of the Holy Land, in, in other parts of the Middle East. They couldn't get enough soldiers, so guess what the Pope said? If you go and fight on the side of the Roman Church you will get no time in purgatory straight to heaven. Okay? It's an incentive. It's, it's, it makes it likely that more people are going to go. And then 200 years before, before we're talking about with Luther, 200 years before, they weren't getting enough visitors to Rome, and, and visitors to Rome meant more money for the church. So they gave an indulgence to people who did pilgrimages to, the Rome, to Rome itself. So they would come and give money and, and frequent the the places, the the center of Roman Christianity. During Luther's life, just as this story of the thunderstorm and everything is coming, during Luther's life, there's new indulgence cause. And you know what it is? St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is going to be this gorgeous thing that some of you have visited, but it's also going to cost a lot of money, and they need money to build it. So, Pope says, you get, a, you get a out of purgatory free card if you just do money to the, to the building project. Is that a, a prerogative you'd like to have, Dave? Yeah. Um, we don't do that around here, right? Have you ever felt like, if I don't give money, I'm not going to heaven? We don't do, we don't do that around here. By the way, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't do that anymore, but they had a bad stretch. And, and, and Luther, <laughs> Luther called them on it. Because he read, he read Romans and he read Galatians and he realized that's not at all it. Because you can, you can go and fight a war without your heart ever changing. You can go and take a pilgrimage without your heart ever changing. And you can give money without your heart ever changing. But everything you read here was about what happens in us and what we believe and how that changes everything in our lives. So for Luther, it wasn't I got to do certain things or God's not going to like me. And it wasn't, I got to do certain things to get sprung from purgatory. It was only faith. Do you see how that works? Only faith. None of those competitors, none of those obstacles, because they were getting in the way of people connecting with God. Now, if we've done, what is, what is faith? And we've done, why is it a solo for Luther? We close with why it's a solo for us. Now, Anybody been, been offered an indulgence lately? No, we don't do that, right? We don't do that. But there are a lot of things in the way we set up our lives that make us feel better or worse for how much we've accomplished, make us feel like God loves us more or less for what we've done. Yesterday, my son Isaac graduated from St. Andrew's Episcopal School, and the hearty and, and vivacious young chaplain was the closing voice of the day. 
All day they'd had these great speakers, but you know how graduation speakers go. They're asking you to do something, to go forward, to aspire, to move on into a great next that you're going to be saving the world or you're going to be doing this or you're going to be doing that, right? She got up at the end, and, and by the way, the graduation speakers were great. But she got up at the end and knowing that graduation days can be a little daunting because there they are barely knowing where they're going to college but not knowing what they're going to do there and how in the world am I going to be the person I'm supposed to be and all those things. And she got up and said simple, a simple thing to them. She said, nothing in the world that you can do could make God love you any more. And nothing in the world that you could do could make God love you any less. And you could feel the graduate's shoulders go down. This is unconditioned. We don't have to earn this. Friends, you and I have our version of this. And sola fide, only faith, lands in us because of those. Just to bring it home with an illustration from the Scripture. Do you know the story of the thief on the cross? Jesus was crucified between two guys, and they had a little conversation according to Luke's Gospel. One of them was shouting, you've saved others, why don't you save yourself and us? He's mocking Jesus just like the soldiers had done, just like the crowds had done. He's joining the fray with mockery toward Jesus. And the guy on the other side, he says, this guy hasn't done anything wrong. You and I, we we deserve our punishment, but he hasn't done anything wrong. Take it easy. And Jesus, breathless on a cross, turns to him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Think about that for a minute. pastor named Alistair Begg in, in Cleveland did his own imagining of it. He said, I want to see that guy after I die, when I'm in heaven, I want to see that guy because I want to ask him what went on. He wasn't baptized, he hadn't gone to Bible studies, he hadn't done anything you're supposed to do, and there he is, he made it, right? In fact, he envisions what happens at the pearly gates. He says, the guy shows up, and the angel at the pearly gates says, "Uh, so what what brought you here? How'd you get here? He says, "I, I don't know. And the angel says, surely you must know. What was it that recommended you to be in this place? And he said, I don't know. And so the angel went and got his superior. The superior came back and said, uh, let's, let's just do some basics. Uh, talk to me about your understanding of the doctrine of justification by faith. And talk to me about whether you have been to church in, in this way or that way. And, and the guy says, I have nothing. And so they finally get exasperated and said, on what grounds do you present yourself here for eternal life and he said the man on the middle cross said I could come the man on the middle cross said I could come faith is receiving grace folks it's only that and a lot of good things come out of it but if we start to think there's anything before it we lose We lose the straight-on relationship with God. We lose what the guy on the cross next to Jesus knew. All I have to do is say yes. Amen? Amen. 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 I forgot my last speaking part. I'm supposed to tell you, class dismissed. (laughs) Have a blessed day. Go in the assurance that God loves you just as you are and receive that grace. Amen.